Hello and welcome to Channel's Book Club. I am Olafunle Kasumu. Books tend to be open and revealing. It's one thing for something to be written about you. It is another thing to write things yourself. The meaning and authenticity of the former can be debated or doubted, while those of the latter are often indisputable. After all, they are your exact words. I would like to read to you the very words of a man that Nigerian history has generally been kind to in schools. Many refer to him as the father of amalgamation. You know who I'm talking about, Lord Frederick Lugard. He was the one who supervised the merger of the Northern and Southern Protectorates to form a single Nigeria in 1914. Now, in case you don't know, before 1914, what we had were two separate countries. Yes, two separate countries under Great Britain in the same territory. So there was the Northern Protectorate, which was one country as far as Great Britain was concerned. And then there was the Southern Protectorate, which was another country. Lugard was the one who supervised the amalgamation of both protectorates or countries, if you may. So Lugard wrote the following in page 70 of a book he published in 1926 titled The Dual Mandate. What I have here is not The Dual Mandate, but I'll tell you about this book later on. So this book quotes from The Dual Mandate. And 1926 was after he had spent several years in Nigeria and supervised the amalgamation, like I've said. This was his opinion about Africans. Nigerians specifically. Now, get ready for this. It, it's heavy on racism, and you might not find this comfortable at all. But hey, this show is about books, and books bear revelations, even the very tough ones. So here is Lord Lugard's views on Nigeria. I will read. In character and temperament, the typical African of this race type is a happy, thriftless, excitable person, lacking in self-control, discipline, and foresight. Hmm. Naturally courageous and naturally courteous and polite, full of personal vanity, with little sense of veracity, fond of music and loving weapons as an oriental loves jewelry. His thoughts are concentrated on the events and feelings of the moment, and he suffers little from the apprehension for the future or grief for the past. Hmm. His mind is far nearer to the animal world. Imagine that. His mind is far nearer to the animal world than that of the European or Asiatic and exhibits something of the animal's placidity and want of desire to rise beyond the state he has reached. Through the ages, the African appears to have evolved no organized religious creed, and though some tribes appear to believe in a deity, the religious sense seldom rises above pantheistic animalism and seems more often to take the form of a vague dread of the supernatural. If you are getting very upset, just wait a minute. It gets worse from here. He lacks the power of organization and is conspicuously deficient in the management and control alike of men or business. He loves the display of power but fails to realize its responsibility. He will work hard with a less incentive than most races. He has the courage of the fighting animal, an instinct rather than a moral virtue. In brief, the virtues and defects of this race type are those of attractive children whose confidence when it is won is given ungrudgingly as to an older and wiser superior and without envy. Wow. Perhaps the two traits which have impressed me now, listen to the traits that impressed Lugard. Perhaps the two traits which have impressed me as those most characteristic of the African native are, these are the, these are the traits that impressed him, are his lack of apprehension. How can that 
impress anybody. His lack of apprehension and his ability to visualize the future. Whoa. Now, there have been much debates on Lugard's comments, and understandably, it has generated a lot of emotional outbursts. What I find interesting here is that the views are so strong and so racial that most people, even back then, hardly went as far as publishing such views. Well, Lugard did. Another thing noteworthy here is how come a man who had such views about Nigerians is more or less celebrated in Nigerian history? Or is that a wrong assumption? If you ask the average young person about Lugard, he will tell you, oh, the father of amalgamation. And there's a bit of positiveness in describing him and his role in bringing about Nigeria. Whatever the case, whichever side of the divide we might be, what is important is for Nigeria to value and teach history properly to our children. And we must never be afraid to confront the realities of our history. This quote, which I've just read, is one of such history, expressed in the very words of the chief actor himself. Well, I just read Lugard's quote from this book titled Ignis, written by Rufai Oseni, who is a broadcast journalist and author of several books on Nigeria. There are more of such quotes, facts, and figures in Rufai's book. He's a young man passionate about his country, and you can perceive that in his book, which explores the challenges Nigeria is facing and solutions worth adopting. Rufai joins us today to review his book and discuss Nigeria. Enjoy this. Rufai, thanks for joining us again on Channel's Book Club. Nice it, to have you it's here. It's always a pleasure being here. Thank you, Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Ignis, is this your third or fourth book? Sixth, actually. Oh! <laughs> Sixth, actually. Where have I been? Oh, yeah. Sixth, actually. <laughs> Sixth, whoa, yeah, um, hmm, amazing. Now, th this is fire. Yep, you're on a mission to add your voice, yeah, to Nigeria's future, Nigeria's destiny. Yeah, I I is that what this is all about? This is what it's all about, uh, and, and it's also because I, I see a lot of potentials, and those potentials have not been actualized, and uh, I always want people to sort of like have very veritable conversations, you know, because where we are today, if we're having the right conversations, I'll, I'll feel like, yeah, I'm excited and there's a future. But I'm not hearing those conversations. We're still throwing the baby away with the bathwater a lot. Mm. So we're not even having those conversations. We have a dire problem, but we don't even know we have a dire problem. Take, for instance, uh, a report came out recently that says Nigerians are the sixth most miserable people in the world. So we've gone from being the happiest people in the world to the most miserable people in the world. And we don't even see anything wrong with it. So we're not having the conversations. Look at the Twitter sphere or the Facebook sphere or any other sphere on social media, the armchair critics all around. We're not having the veritable conversations. And that's why I keep writing. And I hope people will read. Well, some of us are, some of us are doing that. <laughs> I hope people will read. Ignis, fire. Nigeria's journey through fire. Yeah. Nigeria has journeyed through fire. Yeah, it's still journeying through fire. It's still joining through fire. It's, it's been joining through fire since the amalgamation happened. Pretty much all of this fire started when the British came in the 1850s, after Lagos was taken over. And this continued 1906, when the South was brought together for the first amalgamation that we don't even talk about. And 1940, when the Northern Protectorate and the Southern Protectorate was brought together for the amalgamation we all know. So it's been a journey through fire. Sentiments, bigotry across board, instability in government. Corruption has always been the order of the day. Tribalism has always been the order of the day. So these are the ways we have constantly journeyed through fire. Mm. It's not any different. In the 60s, yeah, you said things were a lot better, but we still had tribal sentiments. We still had the Wete rally, the Wete. And they were putting petrol on people's houses and burning them. So when I see the last elections and I see the violence, I'm like, we have not transited. So it's still a journey through fire. A lot of graft, a lot of pain, a lot of inconsistency, a lot of lack of spending on the people. I mean, we're, we're sharing the report recently about government spending to people drop year on year since 2003. In fact, what you get from government is just about 70,000 naira year on year. The people have no, almost no feel of the government. And we still pay with about over 65% of our tax revenue still goes to paying for interest on our debt. 
recurrent expenditure of 72 percent of the budget and all of this continues mm. and we're not looking or saying anything about it so, so that's the shocking part and when i think we should have these conversations on starts and everything tribalism is still the other of the day our dr roy calls it the god of small things is still leading the way in our conversation so when we when we're seeing that we have a high infant mortality and we start to start thinking of how to stop that we're, we're talking about how people are sharing money mm. <laughs> i can see i can see um here you've got the crossfire of nationhood the fire of identity the fire of tribalism we've just spoken about the fire of virtues assault the fire of graft the fire of state capture and then the, the ceasefire so basically in this book you're taking the reader through the major problems Nigeria has had over the last you know many decades yes that's correct and this problem and, and, and that seems to be your pattern um, looking at your other books I've read and then this one you you go about painting the picture of what Nigeria is going through what Nigeria yes. is all about and then you go ahead to suggest solutions that's a deliberate pattern right it's, it's a deliberate thing because we can paint the problems all we can, but if we don't suggest solutions, then how far are we going to go? We're just going to keep talking about the problem. I'm sick and tired of window dressing Nigeria's problem because that's what we've done over the years. That's what politicians have done. Like Charles de Gaulle will say, former president, former prime minister of France will say, politicians will say they'll build bridges where they're in their rivers. That's what we've done over the years. Mm. We'll window dress the problem. This is the problem. Everybody seems to know the problem. Mm. But nobody can fix it. I, I, Isn't it shocking? Very shocking. That last elections, everybody said they had the problem, they knew the problem, they knew the solution, but nobody can fix it. Mm, that's so true. There's, there's something wrong. Yeah, that's true. Everybody knows the problem. You call an average Nigerian, he will analyze the problem. And you know what Namdi Azikiwe said? We suffer from analysis paralysis. Mm. We can analyze the problem so well, but nobody knows the solution. Mm. Or they, 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 they think they know the solution once they, once they started to say it's not working. Mm. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you to say something about the solution, mm. uh, some of the solutions you mentioned in this book. Mm. But the, the problems that you highlighted here, I found some very, um, should I say revealing, you know. For example, while reading the chapter on the fire of tribalism, page 35, which, mm. in which you spoke about the tribal problems of Nigeria mm. and so on, which is uh, everybody talks about. Mm -hmm. but you then highlighted the Ife Modakeke tribal um, troubles. Yeah. You know, and while reading it, I, I said, whoa, you went through the history of the war, in yeah. quotes, between Ife and Modakeke. It's amazing. The two bloody battles of 1849, the communal war of December 1882, the conflict over selection of imam by the Modakeke in 1934, the Isakole. 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 Dispute of 1946 to 47. The confrontation over the reception of a British parliamentarian in January 1949. The conflict over the establishment of Mudakeke High School. The conflict over the establishment of Olon Rushugo Plank Market. Um, the request for a separate local government council, which began in 1950s. So they've had a long history of... It's, it's always been wars. So this tribal thing is not just about the north versus the south, the east versus the north. It's amongst us. It's just like the Kiriji wars and the Jalumi wars. The Yoruba nation had fought wars. I don't know why. What caused the Kiriji wars? The Oyo people thought the Ikiti wanted to do dominance. And Ijeshekiti Parakpo came and they started fighting. One of the reasons why the British came into us and, and took over our nation was because the British could stop the war, the Yoruba Civil War. Why are we fighting? I mean, I'm not saying we don't have values we owe there. I'm not saying wars don't abound in the world. But it's still our problem. And when I say the tribalism, it's not the tribalism amongst North and South now. The wars we are fighting within ourselves. Wherever we are in this country, if Amudakeke is one, I'm happy peace was restored. But it is very painful that why we should be a united force for development, we're constantly fighting. Just like the Jaws and the Shekri. I was aware when that crisis happened. Mm. And I saw how it spanned on and on and on. I'm like, why are brothers fighting?